Hello, my name is Jonathan Durantano, and I'm an assistant professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Today I'll be discussing neck dissections. A neck dissection, also called a cervical lymphadenectomy, refers to the removal of lymph nodes and the surrounding fatty tissue from the neck for the purpose of cancer treatment. Lymph nodes are part of the lymphatic system which is a network of channels distributed throughout the body. These lymph channels are similar to blood vessels, but instead of carrying blood, they carry lymph, a liquid consisting of white blood cells and serum. This lymph is circulated throughout the body and then delivered back into the major blood vessels in the neck. Along the way, lymph nodes interrupt these channels and act like filters. When a cancer is nearby, these lymph channels can carry cancer cells. These cancer cells may become trapped and begin to grow within a lymph node, and this is known as a lymph node metastasis. Lymph nodes are located throughout the neck, but for treatment purposes, the neck can be divided into different lymph node levels. Level 1 refers to the lymph nodes located underneath the chin and the lymph nodes that surround the submandibular salivary glands beneath the jaw. Levels 2, 3, and 4 contain the lymph nodes located next to the jugular vein as it runs down the length of the neck beneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This extends from approximately the level of the mandible down to the level of the clavicle. Level 5 contains the lymph nodes located behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle but in front of the trapezius muscle. Level 6 contains the lymph nodes in the central portion of the neck adjacent to the trachea and level 7 contains the lymph nodes located in the mediastinum. There are three different types of neck dissection, radical, modified radical, and selective neck dissection. Radical neck dissection refers to the original surgery, which was popularized by pioneering surgeon Dr. George Washington Crowell over 100 years ago. And for much of the 20th century, radical neck dissection was a standard procedure for all lymph node removal in the neck. In a radical neck dissection, all of the lymph nodes in levels 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are removed with their fatty tissue. In addition to the lymph nodes, this operation also removes the submandibular gland, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the jugular vein, and the spinal accessory nerve. Removal of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and spinal accessory nerve often cause significant drooping of the shoulder, which can be very painful and debilitating. Because of this morbidity, as well as the improved understanding of how cancer spreads throughout the lymph nodes, radical neck dissection is now rarely performed in my practice. The only circumstance in which I perform radical neck dissection is in a very advanced cancer in which the sternocleidomastoid muscle, jugular vein, and accessory nerve are all being invaded by tumor. In a modified radical neck dissection, the lymph nodes from levels 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are removed, along with the submandibular gland, but at least one of, if not all of, the structures sacrificed in the radical neck dissection are preserved. As extensive research has demonstrated that cancer in certain areas of the head and neck most commonly spreads to certain groups of lymph nodes, the modified radical neck dissection was refined even further into the selective neck dissection. Instead of removing all of the lymph nodes from levels 1 to 5, only certain levels of these lymph nodes are removed. The type of selective neck dissection and the levels removed will vary depending on the primary cancer site and the lymph nodes at greatest risk of developing metastasis. Neck dissection is performed under general anesthesia while you are completely asleep. We make an incision that runs along a natural crease in the neck to access the lymph nodes. These incisions generally heal very well with minimal scarring and provide safe access to identify the vital structures in the neck. Except for the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the case of a radical neck dissection, no major muscles are removed and there is no risk of long-term neck weakness. Depending on the volume of disease present in the neck, the patient's specific anatomy, and the number of lymph node levels being removed, neck dissections typically take approximately two to four hours to complete. Plastic drains, called Jackson Pratt drains, are placed into the neck incision and used to prevent collections of blood or fluid that might collect where the lymph nodes previously existed. Like all surgery, there are specific surgical risks with neck dissection. While complications from neck dissection are usually minor, they do have the potential to be serious. The potential complications of the procedure are divided into nerve injury, vessel injury, 
lymphatic leak, and infection. During neck dissection, a number of important nerves in the neck are identified. The nerves that are at risk for potential injury in neck dissection are as follows. The spinal accessory nerve provides motor function to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and trapezius muscles. The spinal accessory nerve is identified during every type of neck dissection. Weakness of the trapezius muscle is expected after radical neck dissection when the spinal accessory nerve is removed, but weakness can also occur even when the nerve is preserved. When the nerve is preserved, recovery is expected within a few months of surgery. A small branch of the facial nerve is encountered just below the jawline at the top of the neck. This is called the marginal mandibular nerve. This nerve is most at risk during removal of the level 1 lymph nodes as it is identified and mobilized when performing a level 1 neck dissection. Not infrequently, a temporary weakness of the lower lip results from this mobilization. Weakness of this nerve is evident as a weakness in the depressor muscles of the lower lip, which appears as a crooked smile. If the nerve is intact at the end of the procedure, full recovery can be expected, but it can take several months for the function of this nerve to return. The lingual nerve is a branch of the trigeminal nerve, and it provides sensation to the anterior half of the tongue. This nerve is only visualized during removal of the level 1 lymph nodes in which the submandibular gland is being removed, as the nerve lies on the posterior surface of the gland. Weakness of this nerve can present as decreased or absent sensation to the front half of the tongue. The hypoglossal nerve enters into the tongue to provide motor function to the tongue. Weakness of this nerve can present as a weakness on one half of the tongue with resultant difficulty in speech articulation and swallowing. While weakness is generally transient, if persistent, it can be improved with postoperative speech therapy. The vagus nerve is a cranial nerve that runs from the brain into the neck, where it descends along with the carotid artery and jugular vein within the carotid sheath. The vagus nerve gives branches to the throat and voice box, providing motor function of both the swallowing and speaking muscles, as well as sensation to the back of the throat and voice box itself. Injury to the vagus nerve is rare in neck dissection, but a vagus weakness can cause significant problems with speech and swallowing function. The phrenic nerve travels along the floor of the neck within the fascia overlying the scalene muscles, traveling down to provide motor function to the diaphragm muscle. With careful technique, the phrenic nerve is generally not disturbed during neck dissection. Injury to run phrenic nerve generally does not cause any symptoms, but may be visualized in chest x-ray as an elevation of the diaphragm on one side. Injury to both phrenic nerves can potentially cause difficulty with breathing, though this is very rare. The brachial plexus is a bundle of the nerve traveling to provide the arm with its motor and sensory function. Injury to the brachial plexus during neck dissection is very rare, but may cause weakness or sensation loss in the lower arm or fingers if it occurs. Many arteries and veins are encountered during neck dissection. Most arteries and veins within the neck can be safely ligated and removed if necessary without incident. The two largest and most important vessels within the neck are the internal jugular vein and the carotid artery. A carotid artery is the major artery in the neck originating from the aorta and traveling up through the neck where it branches into the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. The external carotid artery gives off numerous branches to supply the structures of the neck. The external carotid artery can be ligated and removed without incident. In some people, the internal carotid artery can be ligated and removed, and the brain can still receive its necessary blood flow through several smaller blood vessels called collateral circulation. However, many people do not have this collateral circulation, and stopping blood flow from a carotid artery can lead to a stroke. The carotid artery is not removed during neck dissection, and fortunately it is very rare that the artery is invaded by cancerous lymph nodes. Invasion of the carotid artery by cancer is often a reason not to operate and to pursue alternative forms of treatment. As opposed to the carotid artery, the jugular vein can be removed without consequence because of the drainage provided by other veins. Bleeding is a potential complication of any surgery, and neck dissection is no exception. Yes, all patients undergoing neck dissection are admitted to the hospital following surgery to ensure a safe post-operative course. Once you are able to swallow liquids by mouth and you can manage the wound drain on your own, you are able to be discharged home. Most patients are able to be discharged home the day after surgery if they wish. Patients leave the hospital with either sutures or staples holding the incision together. A drain will likely be in place at the time of discharge. Once the drain output is less than 30 milliliters per day, the drain can be safely removed in clinic without discomfort. 
Yes, as Georgetown is an academic teaching hospital, residents and medical students are typically present for neck dissections. While I'm always in charge of the operation, complex head and neck surgery requires multiple sets of hands to be performed efficiently and safely. Once the operation is over, the residents serve as our eyes and ears for our patients who are recovering on the floor. One of our residents is in house and on call 24 hours a day, so they are always on hand to manage any issues that may occur. I firmly believe that the presence of residents and medical students in the hospital is a valuable asset to patient care. Once you are home, I'll have you apply a topical emollient, such as Aquaphor, to the wound twice each day. For drain care, you will empty the drain bulb twice each day and record the output. Starting 72 hours after surgery, you may begin to take showers. Once your sutures have been removed, you will continue applying the topical emollient twice per day for the next month after surgery. After this, you may use Mederma for an additional two months if you wish to help minimize scarring. If you go home with a drain, you will take an antibiotic at home while the drainage tube is in place. You will also be provided with a prescription for a pain medication to take on an as-needed basis. Expect to eat a liquid and soft diet for the first few days after surgery, after which you can return to a normal diet. If there's any concern for chyle leak after surgery, you may be asked to eat a low-fat diet only. Please call my clinic if you develop a fever, have redness or increasing swelling or pain around your incision site, or have any difficulty breathing at all. You will first be seen in my clinic for removal of your drainage tube and for suture or staple removal. Pathology results are generally available about five working days after surgery, and we will review the pathology results together at the time of your first follow-up. Once your sutures have been removed, you will then be seen in clinic every two to three weeks until your healing is complete. Long-term follow-up is determined by the pathology of your disease.